Hey everyone, I'm Mike Musto and welcome back to another episode of the Hemmings of Hot Rod Barbecue. On this episode, we have Mr. Jonathan Whaley, who's the founder of an apparel company called Blacktop Yacht Club. Now, Jonathan is a super nice guy, unbelievably talented designer. So on this episode, we're going to talk about not only apparel design, but automotive design as a whole. We're going to talk about where it's been, where it's at, and more importantly, where it's going. So give us about three seconds, grab a tasty, frosty beverage, and uh, we will see you very shortly. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue. My name is Mike Musto, and today I have one of the, I'm going to say one of the, the coolest and most creative people that we've had on the show, Jonathan Whaley of Blacktop Yacht Club Apparel. Ooh. Now, now this is, this is an automotive apparel brand that, from a design perspective, everything is original. From a creative perspective, I mean, this is what, literally my favorite hat, as you can tell by the sweat stain on top. I never take it off. Um, so it's like just some really great stuff. Um, but Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, no problem. We got a lot, we got a lot of talk, a lot, lot to talk about today. Oh, well, how, how long do I have you for? <laughs> well, let's, let me, let's start out by saying, how did you get into the hobby as a whole? How, but before we get into automotive, how did you get into design, into apparel design? Oh, that's easy because the two kind of go together. Okay. So always, you know, come from a creative family, also come from a hot rod family. And there I am at a high school. What am I going to do with these skills that I have? And this was back in the eighties. So the options were somewhat limited mm -hmm. and I wanted to design cars. That's what I really okay. wanted. But if you can remember back to the eighties, uh, you didn't even know if there was going to be an auto industry at all. Right. <laughs> right. So it's like, is there much, really much future into this? Do I really want to be designing little Locano boxes? Because mm -hmm. um, really that's what, you know, yeah. this is a crap that we're putting out then. Of course, now they're becoming more coveted. But back then it was like, you know, these things are garbage. Right. Um, so I said, well, you, you know, okay, that really doesn't look like a very good prospect for the future. What else am I into? Well, you know, I always like to dress cool and, 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 you know, basically for me, it was, you know, like cool cars, cool clothes, pretty mm -hmm. girls, you know, guns, anything that was, you know, all American, yeah. that kind of stuff. So I decided, well, you know, maybe I'll try my, my hand at fashion. Spent eight years in fashion school. Very crazy. Um, very difficult. Very competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, made it through. And that's really how it began as far as the fashion world is concerned um and then you know 25 years later that original thought about cars and the yep. fashion thing that i had made a career of and made you know money on um kind of came together and that's that's where black tuck yacht Yacob came from gotcha yeah and, and and it's very true i mean every every type of automotive culture right whether you're into hot traditional hot rods muscle cars racing exotics they all have their own specific style to them for the most part right well you'd hope so a lot of unfortunately a lot of them don't have any style at all uh, the style <laughs> is wearing a a a a, a, a t-shirt from a show five years ago that is, is shrunken and doesn't fit anymore and right maybe right some, you know oversized cargo shorts that go down below the knees and some crocs with, with with black socks i mean that's what a lot of these guys wear so unfortunately there isn't a lot of fashion or style or yeah you know, swag or whatever you want to call it yeah um, i'm trying to change that obviously and i've done it in the past um i've made a, a living off of creating brands for golf mm -hmm. which is a little different because there was always a certain style to golf because sure it was the affluent background and when you go to courses certainly there's a dress code right, right. um but it really started to take off in the 80s and 90s where it was the dapper golfer and patterns started coming out. But closer to what I'm doing now is golf. I mean, uh, fishing. Huh. Um, efficient men have never been known for their style, but there's brands out there that, you know, they focus more on gear, but it's all about the fishing lifestyle. Yeah. So um, I'm kind of taking the skill set that I have from doing that and, and bringing it into my passion, which is automotive, uh, the automotive world. So, so how do you feel when you walk through a car show and you see, like you said, an old car show t-shirt, jean shorts, and a pair of white New Balance? I try to, well, by the way, New Balances are cool again, but. They I, are cool again, <laughs> but the white, the white traditional New Balance with the no, grass no, stains cool. on the front from those mowing cool. the lawn. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, I, I try to be kind. I mean, you know, there's the, there's the uh, sarcastic side of me. And I mean, I don't know. Men are raised now where they really don't think much about the way they look, unfortunately. Oh. Um, so I don't feel good. Let me put it that way. In fact, you know, <laughs> I'm walking around, I'm like, boy, the task that I have ahead of me is, is daunting. And, I, and, I, and I'm not trying to put anybody down. I don't want people no, I get to it. Oh, you know, like I'm above you because I'm creative and I have style and you don't. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm just coming from, you know, you, these guys, they spend so much money, so much time on their cars, making their cars look perfect, making their cars be an extension of who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. We all do that. I mean, cars yep. really are an extension of who we are. Absolutely. Okay. Why don't take a little bit of that passion and put it towards your own appearance you know and you don't have to be a model you don't have right. to be George Clooney you don't have to be Brad Pitt but right. even a pair of jeans and a white t-shirt is better than some of the comical things that people wear right. at car shows and unfortunately it's not in just the car industry it's it's a it's a cultural thing as a whole in America and across the world that that is such a great point where you said, you know, people put so much time, effort and money into their vehicles. And one of the things that I always look at, you know, on a vehicle are the wheels that go on to a vehicle. Oh, I love right? the wheel. The first thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's like so the car. Yeah, it is. So I, I'm always amazed where you look at an engine compartment and it's flawless and somebody will spend $25,000 on a paint job and the interior is perfect. And then you'll look at the wheels and you go, ah, you just nearly right precisely wrong right. and it's it's like one of those things where it's kind of like where it's kind of like a set a pair of shoes right shoes can make or break an outfit and if you get them right wonderful but if you get them wrong oh wow you got them wrong you no, know and the wheels and i and i give people a lot of pass on the wheels because in my opinion there's not that many options to choose from if you're going to be buying aftermarket wheels um you know, I've done it, especially with some of, you know, my old muscle cars and stuff like that, mm -hmm. trying to find wheels that'll fit it's hard. on a traditional muscle car. There's really, you know, you got the torque thrust, you got the American racing, you got a couple other options, sure. you know, you wheel of antiques that, you know, I'm glad that they're making different sizes in some of the traditional, you know, SS2s and SS sure. and things like that. But when it really comes to finding cool wheels for older cars, it's very, very difficult. And even on newer cars, when you go to the websites to look at the, the wheels, and I know that I'm going way off on a tangent right now, but they all look the same. All the, all the wheels look the same. So unless you have the cash to go out there and make custom wheels, which very few of us do, you're kind of yeah, stuck yeah. with what's in the aftermarket. So right, they'll just right. throw some Craigers on or something like that. And, you know, I mean, so, so I kind of give people a pass on that because I can't even find wheels that I like. You know, right. I can design <laughs> it's them. It's hard but I'm not going to spend $20,000 to make custom wheels. Right. No, it, it's difficult. It's difficult. So as, as a designer, when you, you know, one of the things that I really love about the brand itself is that it's, it's really grassroots. You can't, you really, I think it, it seems like you do and correct me if I'm wrong, go out of the way to cater to the actual enthusiast from a grassroots oh, yeah. level. Oh, yeah. um, and that, I think that's from events from uh, just really monitoring the hobby and what it is doing. Right. Um, and then really focusing on the people. And I think a lot of brands come out and they, they bypass that. I see that a lot in the aftermarket, right? I think a lot of the aftermarket will, sometimes they forget that the enthusiasts on the basic grassroots level are the ones that support the hobby as a whole. They are the right. most important people out there. Right. Um, it's great to go out and look at cars that are three, five, six hundred thousand $600,000, these crazy custom builds. Sure. But I think it's the individual that's in their garage, that's wrenching on the weekends, right. that they're the backbone of the hobby. Oh, I agree. I mean, cars come and go. I mean, how many cars have you owned in your in your lifespan of being a car enthusiast? Way I mean, too they, many. Yeah, they definitely come and go. So when you think about it, it's about the cars, but nah, it's more so about the people. Because mm -hmm. the people are always there, regardless of what car they're taking to the show or what they have in their garage, what they've sold, what they've bought. Right. So, yes, I've definitely focused on the people. I've spent a tremendous amount of time pressing flesh, meeting people, letting them know that there's an actual human being behind this brand. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, first of all, it's not some, you know, Chinese make money kind of thing. You know, you see a lot of that crap on the internet right now. Yep, um, yep. Where they just take something that they think is popular in America. They slap it on a t-shirt, digitally print it on a t-shirt and try to sell as many as they can and then move on to the next thing. 
Um, I, I want people to know that this is not Zazzle. This is not, you know, <laughs> one of those kind of places where they just print stuff out and again, and just try to throw a wide net and try to capture and sell as many t-shirts as they possibly can. And they don't really care who buys it, what the motif is, what, what the t-shirt is about. They really don't care. They just want to sell right, t-shirts. Right. I want them to know that, Hey, I drive these cars too. You know, I have bloody knuckles just like you do. You know, mm -hmm. I've spent more time underneath a vehicle. I don't have a lift. I spent more time underneath a vehicle than I even want to think about in the freezing cold, you know, putting oil on my hands to insulate them so that you right, know, right. I can, you know, they don't freeze. So, I mean, I've had every pain that you've gone through. I've been banded on the side of the road before there were cell phones and had to walk, you know, 15 miles to the nearest uh, phone booth to call my dad to come pick mm -hmm. me up. I mean, I've been through it all just like you have. So I want people to know that it's really important to me because it is about the people. It's about what we've been through collectively um, as a, a community. Uh, yeah. So it's important to me. Where do you Where get do you a lot get of your inspiration from? from? <laughs> Usually from car shows. Um, I had this conversation recently. Someone asked me, I have, I have a sort of a tongue in cheek design. And by the way, I have a lot of graphic t-shirts and hoodies, but that's because it sort of was a COVID related thing because when COVID hit, I wasn't going to have, I wasn't going to hold inventory because inventory mm -hmm. is the killer of so many businesses. Correct. I didn't know what was going to happen. The supply chains were screwed up anyway. So even if I wanted to bring stuff in or, or buy it, I couldn't anyway. Right. So graphic t-shirts obviously make a statement. Everybody wears them and, and of course hoodies. Um, and I don't have to hold inventory. I print as needed. You know, I can just print it right over here. I can embroider right over here as yep. the orders come in. So I didn't have to have a warehouse full of t-shirts or jackets or whatever. However, things are changing and we're starting to bring in the jackets, the outerwear, uh, leather, things like that. So things are changing. But specifically about to the t-shirts um, in some of the graphic ideas, I was, I was talking to somebody uh, recently and they asked me, I have this t-shirt that's uh, burnouts for Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's a tongue in cheek joke. Uh, tongue in cheek joke. And uh, what well, I said, well, I was at the Adirondack Nationals. And if you're familiar with the show, there's the main street there. It's called Canada Street because it, yep, it goes all the way up to Canada, goes all the way up to Montreal. And there's right in front of the Fort William Henry, there's sort of a, a, a it goes up an incline. So it's a perfect place for people to do burnouts because the gravity of the hill makes it so you can control your car more and you don't go mm -hmm. creaming into the crowd and kill somebody. So there was this, this guy, this dude, and, you know, I don't even think he had a shirt on. He looked like he just, he slept in a dumpster or something because he was out there. I mean, he was partying hard, but he had taken a piece of cardboard or it was a piece of wood and he had written in, in big letters, burnouts for Jesus. And he was out there in the middle of Canada street, you know, because everybody's along the side, you know, you have thousands of people egging him on, you know, light him up, light him up, light him yeah. up. And he's out there in the street and every time a car would come by, he'd like stand out in the middle of the road on the white line and he'd hold it out there. And he would just, you know, like, if you don't do a burnout, you know, you're going against God. Or so, I don't know what the, the implication was. And I, cause I don't know how Jesus came into the whole thing. So, you know, I'm thinking that my son and I are laughing and it's like, you know, I got to make a t-shirt out of that because <laughs> it's so, it's so like silly and doesn't make any sense, but that's what's so funny about it. Right. So, uh, it's not blasphemous or anything. It's just that I thought it was funny. Oh, no, so, and it is funny. So in the, so that's a larger answer to your question. Most of my ideas I get from people, from situations that I've been in or experienced. Well, that was, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, when we did the the the, the road trip in the Suburban, um, for those out there, uh, Jonathan has designed this this amazing shirt. We have stickers for it, but I mean, it's it's the Sasquatch. It says right. you can't stop big green. And we had, we had kind of gone back and forth with it. And then like, it's an ex forest service truck. And right. the, the image that you have with the Sasquatch with the Hemmings hat on it, mm -hmm. I can't think of a better, more perfect visualization, visu visualization for what that truck represents. Well, and you were really the inspiration for that from one of our conversations, you know, you're talking about the Northwest, you're talking about the truck. And I think you even mentioned Sasquatch before I did. And um, it just makes perfect sense because it's huge, obviously. Bigfoots are huge. It's green. 
and it's a park service vehicle, a forward park service vehicle. Mm -hmm. So um, those things kind of came together to the graphic. And I wish that that graphic, because it is so cool, you're right. That's I wish awesome. it would have a longer life. I wish there was, it was something that could continue. Like, like, can you buy a big green every year for me, please? So we can keep this t-shirt. <laughs> well, the cool part is like every place that we stopped, we, we had these wonderful stickers that you sent us in and we were able to give them out. And everybody was just like, it was a little piece of the truck that we were able to give sure, to everybody. Sure, sure, sure. And it was such a, it was such a great thing because it's such a wonderful representation, uh, representation of what the truck is, what we were doing with it, right. you know? And sometimes you just, you land on an image that encapsulates sure. a mood, a feel, um, and it does live on. So like any, like that image can only be for big green. I'm sorry. Like it won't, right. that's, that, right. it would that's be big, that. Next one would have to be big green too or something. That's, no, yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that so many vehicles out there have something like that, where mm -hmm. you can think of, of, of an image that goes along with it and, and it just sticks to you. And it might not be automotive related at all, right? right. So like a Sasquatch has nothing to do with the Suburban, but when you That's put what it I in love. context, right? When you put it in context. I, I love complete non sequiturs being brought in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. So it, it's very, very cool. So going back to the grassroots part of, part of it, you know, right. there are a lot of companies out there that will, they'll try to start, you know, off in the stratosphere. Why was it so important to, to stay grounded with this brand? Um, the, the most important thing to me was, I guess I want it to be something that transcends what the t-shirts are what the clothes are. I wanted it to mean something more than just, hey, that's a cool t-shirt. So I guess that's part of brand building and every successful brand um, has some romance to it, has authenticity to it. Yep. Um, so the only way that I could figure to do that without buying it, like a lot of companies do, if you have a ton of money, you can market the shit out of it and you can create something that didn't exist before that. It's more of a perceived, reality mm -hmm. but i don't have a ton of money to do that right so i decided that it was really important to me that i kept it i kept it real I, and, and and that's that's why okay so i, I have to ask because one of your t-shirts mm -hmm. has a chrysler crossfire on it oh yeah talk to me now i knowing the history of the crossfire <laughs> especially the the srt you know the srt version as it's uh was was done in the daimler years the srt six yes one hell of a quick little scoot that people never realize so right. what w but you are the only person that i've ever seen put a crossfire on a t-shirt and i needed to ask you about why okay because i think it's i think it's cool as hell <laughs> well the thing is i as a creative person, as a designer, and I'm sure you're, you're similar because you were just talking about the van and the big green, mm -hmm. like things that are different. Like now, always. There's, there's nothing wrong with a 69 Camaro, but I probably will never own one just because it's not unique enough. And, and that's me. That if you, I mean, they're, they're great sure. cars. I love them. They're iconic. I, yeah. I got it. But anything, I like different things. I'll take a Sunbeam Tiger. I'll take a Studebaker mm -hmm. Avanti. I'll take yep. any kind of weird thing that you don't see out there because I want to be the only one in town driving one. Right. So when the Crossfire first came out back in 2003, when they started advertising them and then everything went off the rails, but when they first were coming out, there was kind of a buzz about it because of the styling. It was very um, Art Deco, mm -hmm. had those real sharp lines, um, had the teardrop shape and I'm a sucker yep. for teardrop shape car, you know, whether it's a Jaguar XKE, a 63 Corvette. I love the tear teardrop shape. I love the rounded back in that long hood. Sure. So when it came out, or, or a Porsche 911, I mean, any of that, I mean, they're, they're all that, that whole silhouette I, I go crazy for. So when I saw it, I said, like, you know, this is different and they're only gonna make 3000 a year. That was the plan in the beginning. They made they ended up making more. But in the beginning, so I bought one and I loved it. And then, you know, Chrysler and Mercedes and you know, that divorce and mm -hmm. all that craziness and it became an orphan, sort of a bastard orphan. And uh, it's very misunderstood car. It didn't sell well, um, at least not here in the United States. I think it sold a little better in Europe where they like, you know, more quirky things. Um, but it's, it's, it's German engineering with American 
Art Deco. I mean, basically, it's the Chrysler building. Right, right. In a car with those six <laughs> angular shapes and stuff. Right. And then it got some, then it got bad press because it wasn't fast enough. It didn't have a Hemi in it. It wasn't a V8 and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But who cares? Yeah, but it had, that, that, that engine was the same engine that was in the, if, it was in the. Um, yeah, so SLK. SLK AMG. Yeah. So was it the 330 horsepower or something like that? Yeah, on stock. I mean, I have mine is not stock. I can guarantee you that. Very few of my cars are. But um, yeah, it, it was a great, great foundation to yeah. build a fast car. And sure. it handled it handled pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. it, it handled about the about equal to a Porsche um, Boxster. You know, it's not Which bad. Is great. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was in good company. It was just completely misunderstood. People didn't understand it. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. Like you know, uh, for those out there, you know. I, some of the imagery that Jonathan has, you know, and you could look at it on your website, but there's a document that he sent me. And one of the pictures is a gentleman who's standing next to a, uh, it looks like an F8 green Chrysler 300. White t-shirt, oh, jacket yeah, so over his shoulders. That, yeah, that was shot down at the beach. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a car like that. So I am a, a nut for the fuselage Chrysler bodies, for the C right. bodies. Uh-huh. I, I, one of the only cars that I ever regret selling was my 1970 Newport. I had a Newport custom. Okay. And it's just, I look at that shape now, just this big hulking land yacht of a car. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rear quarter panel was seven feet, two inches long, and it was six sure. feet wide. And it was just, what a presence. And I think that when you come across vehicles like that and, and they kind of, you know, they, they inspire you to, to kind of look upon things differently. Yeah. It's, it's such a great, great thing. And they were so underappreciated for so long. And I, I think the same is with the Crossfire, like you were saying, which is why I asked you the question. Every now and then you get these iconic designs right. and they come back around and then people look back at them and they go, Jesus, I didn't appreciate it when it was out, but my God, look at it now. And why didn't I buy it when it was cheap? Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and there is a very loyal, rabid Crossfire community out there. And I found... Uh, that they were sort of self-hating a little bit because of the way other people perceived the car. So I was just trying to make people, you know, hey, don't worry about what other people think. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Who cares? And, no. and, and I love the big cars too. And unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, they're starting to come into vogue right now. I know. Uh, the big cars, I've always been a big fan of the big Pontiacs. Oh, God. Uh, Catalinas and whatnot? Well, I have a 66 Grand Prix. Grand Prix. Right. Perfect. And I, because I love that aggressive front with the, yep. the, the headlights, the stacked headlights. And sure. if you look at the front, there's so many points that are just pushing out. It's so aggressive, yep. it's so masculine looking. Um, so yeah, I agree with you 100%. And I love putting the side skirts. I drive around mine with the side skirts on because I, I love the way it just looks low, lean, and mean. You know, it's, it was a, it's a, a late model build. It was built in October. So they ran out of 389s. So it has a 400 in it from, you know, from the next year coming up from the sure. 67 year where they, everything moved to the 400. So it, it moves. It really does. Yeah. You know what? Pontiac is one of those brands that, so that when I used to live in Queens back in the day, I had my daily driver was a 69 Grand Prix SJ. Okay. And in 69, when that car came out, it had the longest hood of any car in the United sure. States. Sure. And uh 428 under the hood, uh, mm-hmm. triple gold. It had a fawn top gold leather interior, gold paint. And it was somebody special ordered that car because it had 14 inch wheels with wheel covers and an open diff, but it was an SJ with a 428. So I'm like, weird. that's a weird combo. Very, very rare combo. And it had like all, like I said, leather, but it had the eight track player in the Uh back seat. Right. (laughs) And it was one of those, you know, it was one of those cars where none of my friends at the time understood why I bought it. And I'm like, do you not, see what i see here right like right, do right, you right. not see this this massive point of a hood and right. this interior and this eight track player in the back seat this was a a luxury sport coupe that was so understated sure but yet such a powerhouse right, right absolutely and i think so many of the pontiacs back then were like that right the grand prix the catalinas the big full-size cars and uh it it it, it kind of annoys me that people haven't they're starting to catch on to that, but they haven't yet. And I'm like, why, like, what am I seeing that you're not? Yeah. It's only the creative crew there. I don't know if it was because of John DeLorean or what, but they threw caution to the wind a lot more than the other divisions of GM did. 
and, and did things, you know, that the others either were too scared to do or they didn't have the edict to do. Their management right. said, no, we're not doing that. We're playing it safe. Um, and I, it's funny because I'm, I'm starting to really get into those disco era cars too, you know? <laughs> and it's like, okay, I want one. I know that they, they don't have very good performance, but I don't really care. It's, I was a kid then. It's nostalgic. Yeah. And they're so, I don't know, so corny, so oh, they're so hilarious over the top that I just, I, I, want, I just don't know which one I'm going to get, but uh, I'm going to get. It, they, I think they're all great. I mean, I've had a couple of of late '70s Trans Ams, early '80s Trans Ams, right? And like, I my last Trans Am that I had was Nocturne Blue with a camel interior, right? Big chicken on the hood, turn, mm -hmm. you know, gold dash and bezels, sure, and like sure, sure. it was. It was about as slow as you could go. Right. But my God, the amount of theater in that car, the amount of presence in that car was something whereby, you know what? It was the smog era. There wasn't any performance out there, right? right. Um, so what did designers do? Well, they looked at what they could do to bring the car out to a different sure. segment. Sure. And so, and like I always, I always try to picture, especially with the Trans Ams, like, how did that happen? Like, did they go into the room with a big bowl of cocaine and say, okay, let's, let's do a couple of bumps. And then we're going to figure out that like we came up with this gold chicken and we're mm -hmm. going to put it all over the car. I'm, I'm always so enamored by the way designs like that came about and how. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever done a story, but it certainly would be interesting. I don't know if they're going to, I don't know if it was cocaine in, infused, but I'm sure it was something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it, it's funny because I grew up in the in the eighties, and I used to I used to street race a lot. In fact, I think we had this conversation before. Mm -hmm. That's how I paid for college. And you know, this is in the eighties, and there was this whole crew of, of guys that were a little bit older, and they all had Trans Ams, various different colors, and the Trans Am back then, and, and I hated them because of these these guys that owned them. They were all like had brown leather jackets they used to drink wine in their in their trans ams and they'd be listening to journey and it was like this whole kind of thing <laughs> like who are these douchebags i don't want to be like them so it kind of turned me off for a while on trans ams like that was the type of guy who right. drove trans am gold chains brown leather yep. jacket drinking wine as as they cruise around um and of course they never wanted to race and it's just a whole different animal but then obviously i shouldn't I, I didn't and I don't anymore let that taint my feelings for Trans Ams. And now I, I would love to have one. <laughs> so, so what do you feel? Let me ask you this with, with design right now, and yeah. it, this goes to apparel, but it also goes to automotive design, right? Yeah. Um, everything out there is it, for me, it's as an enthusiast, it's very difficult to look at. I, there's not a lot of, you used to be able to tell every make, every model. Oh, I know. Every, everything. Well, it's funny. We used to, because I was even talking to my wife about that. It's, it, it, we used to, because it was street racing, we could yeah. tell what car it was from a half mile away based on the headlights or the taillights. Yep. Right. Because it could be potential prey, competition, mm -hmm. and you wanted to know before that guy even got up to you if it was worthy of a challenge. Right. So, yeah, I knew every car from the taillights. Now everything looks the same, but I'll let you finish because yes, you're absolutely right about the styling. Yeah, it's it, it's one of those things where it's it's difficult, right? So for you know, and we you know, I review new cars, so I get new cars and I drive them and everything else. The newest car I own is is 2002, right? So almost 20 years old. Right. Um, it's it's it it's hard. It's hard for me to look at a vehicle and be like, I would absolutely spend my money on that, regardless of the performance, because aesthetics are such a massive thing mm -hmm. for me. Where mm -hmm. if I if I can't look at the vehicle, I don't want to drive the vehicle. Right. And that doesn't matter if it's my daily driver or if it is, you know, my weekend car or cars or whatever the case is. Right. Um and I, I feel somewhat bad for designers now because I know they're so constrained by cafe regulations and design regulations and, and things like that, mm -hmm. but still like had, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't know how they actually do it and look back at a lot of the stuff they design and be like, that's amazing. Especially coming from, 
looking at what the United States and Europe has designed in the back, like you were talking about Sunbeam Tigers and E-Type Jaguars and Grand Prix and things like that, where design was so amazing. I mean, just so right. outstanding. And now right. you look at everything and it looks like a jelly bean. It's like, ugh. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just the homogenization of everything. I mean, all the music sounds the same. All the cars look the same. Everything is the same. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. And, and definitely, <laughs> I pick things by the way they look. First and mm -hmm. foremost, um, definitely style over substance. Um, it's great if you can get both at the same time. But yeah, so, okay, say I want to buy a new car. What choices do I have? And I only have a certain amount of budget and I want to buy something American. Well, uh, let's see, I have a Camaro. I could buy a Challenger. I could buy a Mustang. Um, uh, well, I guess that's it. You know? Right. I mean, and, and I don't want an SUV and, and I don't want an SUV. Okay. I already have an SUV. Right. I have a Dodge Durango. I don't need another SUV. That's what my wife drives. Right. Okay? Right. So yeah. What do I do? I don't buy a car, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's tough. Well, that's why it's like, I, you know, I get the questions all the time. Like what, what would you buy? And I'm like, well, again, I, I look at vehicles now more of as new cars, for instance, as appliances because they yep. lack that style. Will they always get me to where I want to go? Of course they will. New cars now will run for 100,000 miles. They don't care. Whatever, change the oil, they're fine. For sure. Um, but they're, they're very um, utilitarian. The right. amount of design, regardless of how fast they are, because they're all fast. Everything's fast these days. Sure. But nothing is, nothing speaks to, to me as an enthusiast, right? So, yeah. for instance, my, my daily driver is a Ford Bronco, not a okay. new Ford Bronco, an old yeah. Ford Bronco, 96, like the OJ style. Right. It is a big lumbering brick of a vehicle that's right. not fast, but I love the way it looks. Every time I get out and I look at it and I'm like, that's what a truck should look like to me, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. a C10 pickup. That's what a pickup truck should look like to me. Right. Um, when I think of a sports car, I think of, you know, uh, a 911. I think of an E-Type. I think of a 308 Ferrari, things with style, things that really have effort and creativity put behind them. Yeah. And I, I know the designers do as much as they can now, but it's 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 very disheartening at times to, to see some no, of the I stuff understand. that's coming. Yeah, they got to get any, any design. They have to get past the suits and the bean counters, which is, you know, like Hadrian's Wall. You're, it's it's not going to happen unless it, it somehow increases profit margin in some way or another. Yeah you can't justify that, then it's not, it's not going to happen. And it's funny. I mean, I, um, I used to commute down about, uh, well, it was, it's, it's really about 40 miles, but depending on traffic, I'm here in Connecticut. So traffic is crazy. Um, it could take me an hour and a half, but I was driving a 1988, um, Jeep, uh, Comanche pickup truck. It's great. And I would pull, it was a very affluent town I worked in. And the truck was old. I mean, it didn't, it didn't look horrible, but uh, it was old, you know, it was showing its age and I would pull in and I would get more attention just because of driving that thing that people mm -hmm. hadn't seen in so many years. And it's so cool and it's so American. And yep. so yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, I yep. basically drove it into the ground and, you know, and basically after, had to sell it because I just, I couldn't put any more money into it. I just couldn't justify it. But uh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So if yeah. you want to stand out from the crowd, what what options do you have these days and and when i said that the camaro and the challenger and the mustang they're all great cars i love them all i would be happy if someone gave me one i might even buy mm -hmm. one someday but you're certainly not standing out in a crowd on any of those because the choices are so few three that any town of any substantial size there's going to be tons of them already so right. again you're not standing out you're not being an individual so that's it's tough for people who want to be different or just you know have something yeah. a little bit different. Well, that, that's what I was saying. Like this week is car week down in Monterey and in Pebble Beach, right? And I, I I view car week for those who haven't been to Pebble Beach car week as the most disgusting and egregious display of wealth in the United States. Like sure. you go down there and you'll, you'll see, it is not uncommon to see a $20 million Ferrari sitting in a stoplight. It's sure. just, it's astonishing. Yeah. Um, however, it's also not uncommon to see another $20 million Ferrari of the same vintage and the same model in the same year, even if they built four of them, right? In total, they're all there. It's not uncommon to see 
uh, a birdcage Maserati. It's not uncommon to see any host of Lamborghinis that are on the road right now right. or, or, you know, Veyrons or whatever the case is. Um, so having something and I'll, I'll go back to your Comanche. If you were to take a perfect Comanche down there, or even not a perfect Comanche, you would be shocked at the amount of people that would come over to it and say, I have not seen one of these in a exactly. million years. Where did you get it? This is so cool. Right. Because it's one style, two attainability, three, it's, it's a piece of American history, Correct. which I, which I absolutely love. Right. Um, and I think sometimes people forget that, yes. you know, and uh, that's why I think what you're doing with Blacktop Yacht Club and the apparel that you're designing is fantastic because I think it does speak to the enthusiasts. And I think people do look at that and it kind of brings them back to a time where things were a little more simple. I think the imagery is, is spot on with today's automotive culture. I, I applaud what you're doing, man. I think it's cool as hell. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that and you're using Pebble Beach as, as a... Uh... As an example, I mean, again, I'm here on the Gold Coast of Connecticut, and one of the tongue-in-cheek reasons why it's the Yacht Club, the Block Talk Yacht Club, is because within walk, short walking distance from where I live, there's three or four different yacht clubs. And with it comes with all the things that yacht clubs represent, affluence, mm -hmm. uh, you know, exclusiveness. And so it was kind of a stick in the eye of that kind of attitude of uh, the elitism of it and i wanted uh, it yeah. to, this is this is a yacht club for everybody that loves their car it doesn't even matter what the car is because that's not yeah. important. it's that you are a member you're part of a club you're part of a group we're all brothers and sisters in this and it's getting more difficult as the car community is coming under uh political pressures environmental okay. pressures, which is the same thing as yeah. political pressures um the electric car mandates which are ridiculous in my opinion, because they're not saving anything really. It's just that, well, we'll destroy Africa with giant Chinese owned lithium mines um, and then burn the fossil fuels, you know, to make the cars and then burn the fossil fuel somewhere not near my car. Jonathan, it, you, you, it's you're still throwing polluting logic. the world. It might even be worse. So why can't we all just, why can't, why can't you have combustion engines and electric engines and hydrogen engines and whatever the hell you want? Why do the governments have to come in, pick winners and losers, and destroy something that is not bad? These cars, our cars, modern cars, do, don't really pollute that much. And the air no. is cleaner now than it's been since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So it's, I don't want to get off on politics, but. No, we, you know what? It's interesting. I mean, being in Cal, listen, I live in the Bay Area in San Francisco. So yeah. I'm at the hub. No, I know. You have, you have, LA. you have pink haired <laughs> activists yelling at you every time you drive down the street. In one of your, yeah. in your bunker, probably. Oh, and, and everything. And I think it's, but what, you know, we, we always kind of go back to like how long these cars have been on the road. Right. Yeah. So like, you know, I've got cars that are 50 plus years old right? and people say, well, you know, how much gas do they burn? It doesn't really matter because it's, it's not in a landfill. It's not polluting anything sure, for the amount the that they get. Yeah, it's, it's the ultimate example of reused recycle. Right? That's exactly correct. Now, are they efficient? Well, no, but I, I don't drive them every day. So like California has come back and they've, they're, they're, California is trying to just crucify anybody that has a hot rod. And it's, it drives me nuts because like, well, like, California is one of the hot rodding capitals, right? Especially SoCal. So, mm -hmm. you know, we look at, we look at all these types of, like they just instituted a law where if you have a tune on your car and you go to get yeah, your car smogged and like, we're like, what are you doing? Like, how do you, they're, destroying the hot rod community they're destroying one of the best parts about this state and it, it as an enthusiast it drives me absolutely absolutely insane and to, what, and to what end how does it make life better for anybody it does it doesn't not at all not at all right so but yes we've had we've had absolutely people come up and say how many miles does that get and i go i don't know six uh, yeah who cares yeah it doesn't matter you right. know what i mean it, I drive it 2,000 miles a year or 3,000 miles a year. What, what is it? It still passes your smog. The cars that, that have to pass smog, they pass. Right. Right. They pass. The cars that don't, that are, you know, pre-75, right. they right. don't. And I right. don't care. I don't care, yeah. So well, it's funny. I mean, do they walk around down at the, the yacht club or the boat club asking guys how much, how many, you know, miles they get on their yacht? No. I, right. I, don't, I don't understand why hot rodders and people who like to have fun 
with cars are become the whipping post for all these environmental concerns. When we are such a minute part of any perceived or real problem with the environment mm -hmm. out there. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely correct. It, it it's it's because we're an easy yeah. target. That, we're an easy target. That's why, and that's one of the reasons why. And I've and I've written some. Uh, I've written a blog recently, and it's and I truly believe it that um, people that you know, because you know how the car community, and, and one of the reasons why I don't think anyone's ever tried to create a automotive lifestyle apparel brand to any success is that there's so many tribes and so many niches in the automotive world. And I'm trying to get the different tribes to understand that we're all in the same boat and that we're all in jeopardy. And the guy said, you know, I hate Chevys. I'm Ford, died Ford blue, Mopar, Mopar or no car. I hate Japanese cars, you know, and that kind of stuff. It's more than this is my preference is that this is my preference and I hate everybody else. And I'm trying to get people to understand there really shouldn't be any hate when it comes to the automotive community sure. because we have these outside forces that are, don't care about it. And one of the things I wrote a, an, a blog about, you know, this ra rabid um, allegiance to car manufacturers is really wasted energy because when you think about it, you know, have these multinational car companies um, that really don't give a crap about you and what you think and what you like. Well, that's uh, very true. So why are you Mopar or no car? Okay, well, the guy in Brussels who's pulling the strings on Stellantis really doesn't care about you and what you want and what you don't want or any of that kind of stuff. They are not a car company. They are a money-making company. So you really should, you know, kind of give it up. Great. You love Mopars. That's great. But don't disparage everybody else who doesn't happen to own one, who doesn't happen to prefer them. You have a hell of a lot more in common with that guy over there with the Chevy than you do with the guy in Brussels who basically pulls the strings for Stellantis and is the one who's going to right. decide if and when the Chrysler Corporation goes 100% electric or 100% hydrogen or 100% gerbil powered, whatever the hell it is, they don't care. They just want to make money. And, and that was my point. Um, it may have got lost on a lot of people because these divisions in the automotive world are, are generations old. They're very sure. deep. Um, but I do what I can. I just want people to, to really kind of come together to the points that you were making about there's a lot, a lot against us these days. And, and if you don't watch out in 10 to 20 years, there may not even be a car culture anymore. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, it's, you know, it, it is difficult to, when I hear people talk about that, well, I hate Fords or I hate this. And I'm like, what? Get, and then I, I'll always engage and say, why? Give, give, me, give me a logical reason right. why you hate this brand. Did they do something to your family? Have you driven, has every single one you've ever driven exploded and left you on the side of the road? Right. Do you, do, do you hate one of their designers personally or one of them? Like, give me a, and nobody, nobody has ever given me any type of logical explanation ever. Right. right. And so, you know, like when I talk to enthusiasts, they'll be like, well, you're a Mopar guy. I'm like, I am not a Mopar guy. I like Mopars. I happen to own a bunch of them. That's fine. But like, what, like I also own like a vintage BMW. And, a sure. vintage, and an old Porsche. So like, right. don't tell me, and, and a Ford, I daily afford. Right. I like design. Yeah. I like variety. I right. like what these things represent and what right. they do when people drive them, how they make, because everybody knows, right? If, if you're buying an automobile, if you're buying a boat, if you're buying a motorcycle, none of these are rational purchases. No, none of they're, them. Not, they're not, they're not needed. They're not necessary. No, right. These are, these are emotional based purchases, right? Nobody rationally would go out and spend $150,000 on a Mercedes SUV no. when you can buy a minivan that does exactly the same thing. It might not make you feel the same way, Correct. right? But that's not rational. That's emotional, sure. right? And so I think you're, to your point, uh, it's 100% accurate where take the stupid blinders off for God's sakes. You know, come together as a community and really in, enjoy the individuals behind it. Don't just look at what they drive. Right. Exactly. So, so, so that's what I am trying to, in a nutshell, that's what I'm trying to create. So yeah. that logo on your hat with the skull and the, in the cross mm -hmm. pistons, if anybody's wearing that, I want it to represent, hey, I'm part of the club. 
you're part of the club. We understand each other, regardless of what we drive. There is a connection there, whether you're a JDM guy, whether you're a Euro guy, whether you're an exotic guy, whether you're a 70 year old muscle car owner, it doesn't matter. So so it's almost like the polo pony on a, a Ralph Lauren polo shirt. That in the beginning was sort of like, okay, you know, we're upwardly mobile, you know, we get each other kind of, that's what it meant. Of course, now it doesn't mean shit because it's been so diluted, mm-hmm. but that's what it meant at the time. And then you have like Vineyard Vines with the little whale on their polo shirts. Mm-hmm. And that meant I really enjoy the better lifestyle. I'm, I love the aspirational. I love my boat. I love to hang out. I'm just kind of preppy. And if you're wearing a little whale on your shirt, we, we're, we're connected. Right. I want to create the same thing amongst our people. Yeah. I mean that our people, I mean, they're, 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 I, we're all connected. Absolutely. We're all oh. connected through octane and exhaust fumes and oil. And I mean, yeah, so that's what I'm trying yeah. to do. Well, I think you're doing which, which a hell not, of a which job. Is not easy. It's not easy. It's very difficult. Well, I, I think anytime you, you try to make a <laughs> statement with something and bring people together, you're always going to get a part of that crowd. That's going to go. No. No, yeah. I don't, because people just like to disagree because they can, because they have the opportunity to, regardless okay. if they believe in your philosophy or not, no, right? No um, but the cool part is, like a lot of people, like every time I wear this, I get questions about it. Everybody's like, what's the logo on that? I'm like, oh, it's a apparel company called Blacktop Yacht Club. You can check out their stuff. Sure, sure, and sure. it's 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 good because it evokes questions and, it asks, and, and people want to know. And I think that's what imagery, that's what we just talked about in regards to design. That's what design does. Right. Correct. Yes. Oh, art in general, anything that is creative, visually, audio, music, it really should mm-hmm. do that. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and it, there's, it, a, there's a huge lacking of that in our society these days. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's funny when you, when you talked about the burnouts for Jesus shirt and then that design, um, people also have to, to have a little bit of sense of humor too. And oh, I feel I've like had that. I've, I've had, I, um, you know, the uh, no airbags, um, we die like real men. I yeah, it's, <laughs> now, I didn't <laughs> come up great. with that saying. It's been a bumper sticker for, for a long time now. But I've never really seen it put on a T-shirt and, and put out there. Now, obviously, that's gallows humor. I don't want anybody to die. You know, right. <laughs> I'm not advocating that. Um, right. <laughs> I did get some nasty uh response to that like i don't think that's funny since my son died in a car accident and i'm like uh, I, I really didn't want to elicit that i, I was just right. trying to, it was just kind of funny i mean obviously no one wants to die but there's something about an old car that doesn't have all the safety features in the backup camera and you know all yeah that stuff. that's that was my only point I didn't right know. Well, you're, you're it, never it, ever. It was basically you could have put it. Real men drive old cars. That would have been another way to put it. This was just a darker way to put it. That's all. Mm-hmm. And it's funny. It's humor. Like get. So it's it's funny. My my wife has a um, an old Grand Wagoneer wood paneling the whole deal. Sure. Right. That's the way she should, should have the paneling on it. It's it, it's great. And the license plate that we tried to get was I wanted to put so waspy on the license plate. Yeah. Because. If you're from the East Coast, like I am, you're in Connecticut. It is the oh, it was the waspiest, yeah, the the whitest waspiest vehicle in the history of the world. It just right. it just is right. Sure. You doesn't. I mean, you want to talk about yacht club? That's oh, I know. That's As it. Kid, you go to the private school parking lot, and all the moms and dads were there in, in those wagoneers picking their kids up. It, so it, it was the Calif- it, it was pre Land Rover. That's right. That's right. So, but California denied the plate. They send it's offensive. Um, and I was like, can you, and I wrote a, a, like a letter back to them. I'm like, do you not see the humor in this? Wait, what's, the, you, what's offense? I thought you could make fun of white people. Uh, apparently. Yes. So they, they denied the plate. And it's one of those things where you go, where, where did the humor, where, and, and you know, as well as I do in the automotive community, humor makes everything go round. If you break something, you're in, you're throwing humor in there to make yourself have a better day or your friends. Right, exactly. It, it's, exactly. they go hand in hand. And so I think so much of it is being lost. I think so many people are taking themselves way, way, way too seriously. Mm-hmm. And it's like, guys, all we want to do is go out and drive cars. All we want to do is have fun with vehicles. We want to do burnouts and donuts and look at stuff that makes us smile. And I think people are, right. they're just losing sight of that, man. 
Well, um, I'm, I'm really surprised at that. That, that, that that would get denied. It, me too. I'm me surprised. Too. I probably I was surprised even what a wasp was, to really, to be honest with you. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so, John, oh, yeah, you this. I, I am a big fan of the 80s uh, heavy metal band, Wasp. Oh, That's absolutely. A- yeah, right. That's what I should have put. Um, so let me ask you. So what is what is next for, for Blacktop Yacht Club? Where do you see design going as far as automotive fashion and things like that? Do you try to anticipate it? Or are you just like, you know what? I'm going to do what I do. And if people come, people come. Well, there's really nothing to anticipate because no one's really ever done this before. Um, at least try to address this kind of lifestyle. What I'm trying to do is create things that um, harken back to a better time, like you said, uh, when men were men and women were women. Um, where, uh, you know, style was important, um, both in the cars and the way people dressed. So, yes, there will always be graphic t-shirts and hoodies and things like that, but I'm it, now I'm going back to creating, like I said earlier, leather jackets, driving mm-hmm. pants, um, things like that, that um, are more of a full collection as opposed to just being the items of graphic t-shirts and hoodies and things like that. Because I've always been a collection designer anyway, because I see the brand, all brands that I've ever worked on holistically. So it goes from the tops, bottoms, sweaters, jackets, everything. Sure. Um, so that's that's where it's really going. But as far as a, a game plan or a blueprint, this is uncharted territory for automotive uh, clothing. Gotcha. Okay. Well, we're, we're coming up on an hour, which is pretty insane because that was a very quick hour. Well, you, um, you can. How long are the podcasts? So you can edit tons out, I guess. <laughs> well, we're not going to edit anything. <laughs> Podcast. Good, I mean, this is great. Good. Like I like. I like. I mean, this is this is the nice part. Is that you know to, to come on and be able to bullshit for an hour is fantastic. I love you know? to bullshit. Are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> especially with with somebody that loves design and and does apparel and knows the culture. Um, yeah, it, it, that's why I truly enjoy doing this show. It's it's just yeah, plain fun. You know, it's right. just plain fun. Um, well, let me ask you this, where can people find you online, social media, where is the best place to go and check out black tub yacht club, as far as the apparel, what you're doing at, at this point in time and probably forever, because I don't want to really go to any brick and mortar stores. Mm -hmm. It's an e-commerce, you know, initiative. So it's really black top, B L A C K T O P Y C.com. That would be the website. And then it would just be Blacktop Yacht Club on any of the social medias, whether it be Instagram or uh, or Facebook. I'm not on TikTok. Okay. That's really crazy. I would hire somebody to do videos. I'm, I'm not doing videos. I got enough oh, okay. things going on in my world. <laughs> do they? Um, so it, it's e-commerce. So everybody could go on the website, yeah, yeah. look at different things that you've designed, purchase them on there. It's both men and women, and yeah. for whomever, they're great stuff. So, um, all right, well. Sir, I can't thank you enough for coming up. We're going to have to have you back on, I think, shortly, because this was a lot of fun. Well, yeah, if any topic you want to talk about, because we don't even need to talk about clothes. I just like talking about different things, um, you know, even just bullshitting about old stories and anecdotes and things like that. It's just a lot of fun. Well, I think next time we have you on, I think what we're going to do is I think you're going to pick three cars. I'm going to pick three cars of our favorites. Okay. And then we'll talk about the design aspects of them and why we actually love them. Okay. How does that sound? That's fine. That's perfect. Good. All right, sir. Well, Jonathan, again, thank you for coming on the Hot Rod Barbecue. Can't, you know, this has been a great quick hour. My God. Mike, Um, I'm a big fan, always have been. And I love talking to you, even when we just talk on the phone. But this this is great. Good, good. Then we will see you again very shortly. Excellent. Thank you again. (laughs) You're welcome. Bye bye. All right, bud. Take care. Thanks for listening, folks. And again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast and uh, hit that subscribe button. And we'll come to you every week.